I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. This week, I had a viewer named Thomas Smart, who I believe I lord here from Matt Taibbi's Substack, who wrote that he was warning his loved ones that he was going to be putting my crazy into his echo chamber. Well, with a challenge like that, today I am really going to be bringing the crazy. I'm going to talk about my favorite topic, which is ultimate reality. And to do that, I'll be quoting from the Sufis, from ancient Jewish traditions, some of my favorite Substack writers like Caitlin Johnstone and Rob Bresny's Real Free Will Astrology that will bring in moles turned into hawks and, uh, and also Terence McKenna. And I will look at Charles Eisenstein and some of his thoughts. And then I'll go into some controversies that have been on the internet, like uh, a kiss that Russell Brand puts on Yuval Noah Harari's forehead. And I'll look at our right to be able to speak and why it is that that is so important. So I'll end by looking at my really craziest thoughts on what I think that ultimate reality may actually be. And as a spoiler, it involves the word tantric. Let's get started. The Sufis have a saying that in the phrase, you and I, there are three entities, the you, the I, and the and. My proposal is that only the and exists, that we only exist in relationships, that we are in the synapse, we're not the individual brain cell. If you've watched my videos before, you've heard me talk about these three possibilities. One, God is a monster who created this world as we know it. Two, there is no God, meaning that we are the only gods and we create reality. And the third being there is no world. Now, I want to clarify that, that by saying there is no world is not saying that nothing exists. It says that we do exist, but that the world exists as an illusion inside of our singular mind, not our minds being subject to the world. Our job is to prove to ourselves that this is a dream, by seeing our power to be able to change it into the dream that we want. And that way we know that it is an illusion, that we can change it. So to do that, there has to be consistency between the meaning of the world and the meaning in the world. So if we are in reality one, we can't believe that we are separate within the dream. And the reason that we're going to want to believe that we're separate is if we think we're better, if we think our safety is in being better than someone else. So overcoming that hurdle, being able to remove that hurdle with practices and just simple applications is the way that we can test that out and allow that awareness of our oneness to be able to come through. In my episode on socio-spirituality, I talk about four beliefs that stem from my core dogma that I'm no better than anyone else. Now, I want to add three more to that. So let's go over what there is and what is a belief. I've said that a belief is making up your mind about something in advance of the facts. But there's also another way of looking at it as an operating system, that these are the things that I choose to live as if they're true. So the first one of those was that people are inherently good. The second, that when they behave badly, systems are to blame. Third, systems can be changed. And fourth, that communities are equally capable of self-governance. Now let's look at what the default system would be that that belief that are the inverse of the ones that I choose. The first would be that people are inherently evil, that we are living in Lord of the Flies and therefore some of us need to make sure and control the others. 
The second is that when people behave badly, they just prove number one. The third is systems can't be changed. Don't waste my time. The fourth is that communities are not equally capable. So we, the civilized, need to govern the uncivilized. To apply these principles, I want to look at Yuval Noah Harari. I did an episode on him called Legal Shaman and Economic Witches, and I look at his conversation with Russell Brand. In that, I show where there's four different places where I agree with Yuval, and then four different places where he's not following his own logic. So by using what he's saying to show, here's the truth that I completely agree with, but here's how he applies it, and it doesn't sync up. That, I feel, is more effective. So with Russell, I think that his way of being able to be not just respectful, but affectionate, to see someone as not separate from him. Where Russell disagreed with Yuval was in terms of communities being capable of self-governance. Russell was talking about the 10,000 villages of Gandhi, and Yuval was saying, no, you need the nation to make people care about each other. So that contradicts some of the fundamental beliefs that I believe Russell and I share, which is people are inherently good and that communities are equally capable of self-governance. But I think the disagreement with Yuval goes much deeper to the more fundamental idea of meaning exist. That to Yuval as an atheist, there is no meaning. You can go have kids or, you know, adopt a religion if you need that in your life. But if you're a grown up, you just admit that there is no meaning, that it's all something that we're making up. But a place that I might go further than Russell is in the next principle, which is that meaning is on our side, that meaning is ultimately good, that it's not about sacrifice, that it is about our power to proliferate and to make everything something that's better without giving up. So one of my principles in terms of developing community and reforming society is that for anyone to gain, no one can lose. And I believe that that is possible because we're not limited in the ways that we think we are. And then my last belief that I choose is that meaning is knowable. And so that's being more of a Gnostic than an agnostic. That's saying we are capable and intended of actually knowing the truth and being able to discern meaning. That's why we're here. That's our only reason for being in this place where we are discerning the dream and figuring out reality from it. So in all of those instances, you can substitute meaning for purpose and for God which would be to say that God exists, that God is good, and that God is knowable. The reason that I think it's important to use that word is because if relationship is all there is, you can't have a relationship with a blob. That personification is essential. A person who's in agreement with the idea that meaning is good and on our side is Rob Bresny, author of Free Will Astrology and also the book Pronoia, which has the idea that the universe is conspiring at all times for our benefit. I've been an admirer of Rob's thinking now for over 40 years, which is a very scary concept. In this week's Free Will Astrology, he quotes a Jewish legend that says in every generation, there are 36 righteous individuals who are responsible for saving the world and that they may never even know each other, but that they are always working together. 
Now, Kurt Vonnegut, I've been reading lately with his book, Pity the Reader, on writing. And he talks about the karas, which is an idea in Cat's Cradle. And your karas are the people that you are always conspiring with in order to work out God's will, but without knowing that that's what you're doing. So this is not uh, an organized religion. This is explicitly a disorganized religion started by a character, Bokanon. Rob also talks about the possibility that everything we do is helping us get through this epic turning point and that every day-to-day decision is something that changes the course of the next thousand years. So in that sense, we are all what my friend calls intertwingled. To live up to that potential, he asked the question the other week, which part of you is too tame, over-civilized, and super domesticated, and what are you going to do about it? A reader named Jason R. wrote, I was like a mole in a suburban backyard. I had just one little path I trod each day to the compost pile and back. I chewed on orange rinds and leftover cabbage. I was tamed by the comfort of my familiar environment, content to have a narrow vision. But then I was eaten by a hawk and became part of a wild free body. Now I perch on the tops of trees and the peaks of roofs. I survey giddy wide horizons from the river to the mesa and far beyond. I have a wealth of choices. Where to fly, what to hunt, who are my allies? My thoughts breathe deep like the slow explosion of sun on the morning lake. I often find with Rob and other people that I read that they're answering a question that's already uppermost in my mind. Last night, someone responded to one of my comments on Caitlin Johnstone's substack saying, it really annoys me when people put links to their own work in someone else's essay as if it's clickbait. So I sent a polite response explaining my principles around that, that it needs to be relevant, that it needs to be a conversation I'm regularly part of and not always with links. But then I went to bed and woke up with that feeling of who do I think I am? Because wanting to write is a non-reciprocal relationship. You have an audience and you are not giving them the same attention that you hope they're giving you. And that's a rough one for me and I suspect for other writers. And so I was especially grateful to read this morning from Rob Bresney, this quote from Terence McKenna. We each must become like fishermen and go out onto the dark ocean of mind and let your nets down into that sea. And what you're after is not some behemoth that will tear through your nets, foul them, and drag you and your little boat into the abyss. Nor are what we're looking for a bunch of sardines that can slip through your net and disappear. Ideas like, have you ever noticed that your little finger fits exactly into your nostril and stuff like that? What we are looking for are middle-sized ideas that are not so small that they are trivial and not so large that they are incomprehensible, but middle-sized ideas that we can wrestle into our boat and take back to the folks on shore and have fish dinner. And every one of us, this is what we should be looking for. It's not your elucidation. It's not part of your self-directed psychotherapy. You are an explorer and you represent our species. And the greatest good you can do is to bring back a new idea because our world is endangered by the absence of good ideas. Our world is in crisis because of the absence of consciousness. And so to whatever degree any one of us can bring back a small piece of the picture and contribute it to the building of the new paradigm, then we participate in the redemption of the human spirit. And I will read you the ending of Caitlin Johnstone's post to which I had responded called Hard to Swallow Pills. Your mistakes don't matter and neither do anyone else's. The self is an illusion and all beliefs are false. The world is so much more beautiful than you realize. You are so much more beautiful than you realize. The world is secretly perfect. 
You are secretly perfect. It is safe to relinquish all labels and let all of life be ineffable. It is safe to relinquish all identity and let yourself be ineffable. The universe is forever out of control, and that's a good thing. There is nowhere to fall to. This is all infinitely supported and profoundly cherished. This is all meaningless, gratuitous, astonishing, and delightful. We are dancing together in the heart of eternity. Your every molecule is intimately embraced by all that is. Everything in existence says yes to itself. Everything in you says yes to everything in existence. Even your no is made of yes. You are beloved. You are love. I want to end by looking at an essay by Charles Eisenstein called Parallel Timelines that describes the reality of the world. And then I want to look at my craziest idea on ultimate reality that I'm bringing back from the abyss. In parallel timelines, Charles responds to an after-school video called New Discoveries That Completely Alter Human History. And that goes into archaeological evidence that things that could not have possibly been true for the technology of the age were evident that things have been built, monoliths have been built, that there is no way to be able to explain. So these go into theories of aliens, of superhuman species, of uh, a regression in technology to the present day. And he talks about a technology that isn't so much artificial, a technology of the mind and how we may have lost that ability to be able to alter things. I think that this fits what I'm talking about, about this being a dream, and that it's a simpler explanation to say that we're writing history backwards, that the evidence that we're looking for, that this is a dream, are the clues that we are planting into the dream all the time because we're ready to wake up. Now let's look at my craziest idea. If the Sufis are right and that the relationship is all that really exists, what is our actual relationship to God? There's one way in which I disagree with A Course in Miracles, which I've been studying for three decades. And that's that all three personifications of God are masculine, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all represented as he. That doesn't make sense to me because our world is clearly a reflection of reality. And why, if you were going to only have two entities in reality, would you make them both masculine? Why, how can you have a father and a son and no mother? no lover, no beloved. So in A Course in Miracles, it talks about how we are God's creativity, not God's creation, that we have everything because we are everything. Everything is contained within us. And so I think that we are the womb of God. I think that God, because of not wanting to be alone, decided to put that little bit of separation between God's self and God's creativity, that way of being surprised, of being delighted. And so I think that we are God's beloved and that the character of God is masculine, but the character of us is the eternal feminine. And so I think that we are joined with God in eternal tantric union and that the entire universe exists in our belly and we are always adding to it. We are always proliferating because that's what brings us joy and that's what brings God joy to add to the love. Thank you for participating in my fish dinner. 
And now, if you'd like to go to a fish of a more manageable size, here's my one on Yuval Noah Harari called uh, Legal Shaman and Economic Witches. And here's a playlist called Mind Over Matter, which goes into the ultimate reality questions in more depth. And thank you for being part of my community and subscribing.